Hi friends, and thank you for dropping in to our Friday program, last of the week, remembering tomorrow the first of our uh, live guests on our live programs uh, for Saturday morning. So that's 9 a.m. Thai time. Already got quite a few questions from many of you, so we'll be addressing those. As long as anybody who turns up tomorrow, you're all welcome. Uh, there's no membership or anything, so you're just welcome to drop in, have a chat, and uh, we'll get started tomorrow, 9 a.m. Thai time. Seem to have a lot to get through today. Uh, please, if you get a moment, subscribe to the channel while you're there. But we're going to start in Malaysia today because a bit of a watershed election and uh, we've got Anwar appointed as the Prime Minister. By the way, this is from the New Straits Times, not to be confused with the Straits Times, which uh, is Singapore's main newspaper. The, by the way, the light is streaming through, the sunlight streaming through the door, so it's very bright here at the moment. But uh, to the story, in a statement, the Comptroller of the Royal Household, basically that's the palace spokesperson, said the decision was made after a special meeting of the Conference of Malay Rulers at 11am yesterday. Just very briefly, none of the major parties got a majority uh, in the election last weekend. And uh, so it was up to the monarch uh, in Malaysia to appoint a prime minister. He gave them uh, a few days to try and put together their own uh, sort of coalition, but it didn't happen. So he actually appointed the uh, the party and the leader of the party with the highest number of votes to, uh, to form a party. It'll be a minority government until they can test it in parliament to see if they do have the support. So interesting times for Malaysia, noting that the party that's led uh, Malaysia Oh, gee, what, since 1949, I think only got 30 MPs into the parliament, which uh, is a, a watershed in Malaysian politics. So further to that, His Majesty the King has given the consent to appoint Anwar as the 10th Prime Minister. They actually have uh, nine kings in Malaysia, and they circulate, I think, every four years who, uh, who will be the head of state. So uh, I'm not sure I've got that absolutely right, but it's a constitutional monarchy at the end of the day. And uh, the king is well within his constitutional rights to appoint the prime minister if the political parties weren't able to do so themselves. Then another look uh, at the same story. Malaysians took to social media to celebrate Anwar's appointment as PM. The uh, top line there, after five days of uncertainties due to a hung parliament, Malaysians have taken over social media to celebrate the PH chairman, uh, Anwar Ibrahim's appointment as the nation's 10th Prime Minister. The Straits Times, this is the Singapore newspaper, Anwar Ibrahim to be sworn in as Malaysia's 10th Prime Minister at 5pm, that was yesterday afternoon. And the palace said in a statement that the king made the decision after conferring with the other rulers in a special meeting of the nation's nine state monarchs. After UNMO, that's basically the uh, the party that's been leading Malaysian politics uh, all the way since 1949, confirmed early Thursday that it would join a unity government. So a big change to Malaysian politics with a minority government heading the way to parliament. Uh, it's been a very turbulent time over the past, well, gee, nearly decade, especially the 1MDB scandal, which has seen one of their prime ministers now serving a sentence in jail. And we're seeing the fallout of that uh, in these ballots held over last weekend and the appointment of this uh, this new government. By the way, thank you to Five Star Marine. If you want to take a private tour in Phuket, then you just have to go to their website, have a look through and contact them. Uh, a private tour out to any of the magnificent islands off Phuket. They come heartily recommended from me. So there's a link in the description in this video. You're watching TNT. You're watching the TNT program. We do this five days a week and appreciate you dropping in. Now, I neglected to say yesterday, and I'm sorry that I uh, sort of forgot, but happy Thanksgiving to all our American friends. Hopefully you had a uh, great collection of your family and friends for Thanksgiving. I'm not 100% over the actual holiday, exactly what happens. Uh, it's not something that we celebrate in Australia, but I know it's a big day for Americans and hope you had a, uh, a good day for your Thanksgiving. 
2022. To our next story, and this is from the Pattaya Mail, Thailand on track to hit one million tourist goal. This has been pretty much the goal set uh, since the middle of the year when Thailand was reopening its borders. So now as we're approaching the, uh, the end of the year, looks like we might get that 10 million international arrivals. The story goes on to say that the tourism and sports minister said the top five groups arriving by air were, and this is right across the first 10 months of the year. So from January, the start of the year to uh, to the end of October. So it was uh, Indians, Russians, South Koreans, Singaporeans and Americans. So they were the top five nationalities to arrive throughout this year, led uh, early on by the uh, surge of Indian tourists coming to Thailand, which really without them uh, would have been a very, very slow recovery indeed. But that's been taken over. And if we did check these numbers just for the last month, it would be Russians by a long, long way. So let's just go further into this story regardless of border crossing. So this takes into account all the people that have come into Thailand for whatever reason and uh, in any particular manner, not just by air. If you buy boat as well, I suppose. Regardless of border crossings, Malaysians top the list at 1.45 million, then Indians, Singaporeans, Laotians, and Vietnamese. So a lot of people coming across the land borders here in Thailand. Not everybody arrives by air. And uh, just noting there that, of course, many of those people coming across the land borders probably aren't considered as tourists. Many coming across just for daily business, day trading, or maybe uh, coming up for a long weekend in the case of some of those Malaysians coming through the southern borders. Right, uh, to the next story, and I suppose this is the latest focus on the cannabis bill, which is now being discussed in Parliament. Just uh, note that uh, some comments were made in Parliament yesterday, nothing really very illuminating, but let's just go through the latest situation as I do my best to try and keep you up to date with this uh, long-winded story. And this from Tiger, Thailand bans recreational use of cannabis inside cafes. Just noting that there have been a lot of these little retail stores opening up and people can go inside and uh, buy some cannabis and have a little bit of a puff inside. Uh, Well, it looks like they can't do that anymore. Cannabis shops and cafes in Thailand are no longer allowed to let customers smoke the plant recreationally on the premises anymore. On-site consumption of cannabis for medical purposes is still permitted. But wait for it. If the cannabis is sold by a medical practitioner, which of course it wouldn't be, the announcement was made in the Royal Gazette yesterday and is effective immediately. So this is all part of the rear guard action as the public health minister, Anaton, tries just to roll back his legislation enough to get this cannabis bill through parliament. So uh, quite a lot of politicking going on and the poor people that have invested in good faith in uh, this particular industry and all the people that have uh, thrown some investment money at the cultivation of these crops they must be scratching their head and wondering what on earth they were thinking when they got involved. So advertising the sale of cannabis flowers is prohibited and cannabis consumption inside shops, cafes we just mentioned is banned unless sold by a medical practitioner. Uh, Down the bottom there, the announcement also said that cannabis flowers are not allowed to be sold online, cannot be sold in vending machines, and controlled herbs cannot be sold in temples, religious sites, dormitories, parks, zoos, and amusement parks. So we're sort of seeing just uh, little ticks and crosses and dotting the I's and uh, crossing the T's is going on. Uh, The cannabis bill is being discussed in Parliament this week, probably go to a vote sometime next week, and I really don't know what's going to happen. I still think the numbers will vote the bill down, and then I'm not exactly sure what's going to happen after that. All I can do is report. The story went on saying that the new control measures detailed in the Royal Gazette are intended to be a compromise to keep everyone happy, and that's right, but this next part is not, until the elusive Cannabis Act comes into law next year. Well, even if it gets passed in Parliament, there's a period of 90 days until it gets signed into the Royal Gazette. Well, that's usually what happens, but it has to be passed first, and uh, that hasn't happened 
as of yet. So I'm not sure where they got that information, but uh, that is slightly misleading. Uh, from one type of consumption to another, and this is from The Nation. Michelin awards two stars to six restaurants and one star to 29 in its 2023 guide. Who follows the Michelin guide to go and find some restaurants? Uh, good to see a great foodie scene. It's always, always existed in Thailand. From the very, very cheap to the very, very expensive, there's literally something for everybody and some very fine restaurants, particularly up in Bangkok, here in Phuket as well. Six eateries have retained two Michelin stars for excellent cuisine and 29 restaurants have earned one star. And this was announced yesterday. And down the bottom there, this is the six two-star restaurants. Just wondering if you've been to any of these. Uh, ah Han, Le Normandie by Alain Ro. We've got the Chef's Table, Mesa Luna, Suring and Sorn. I haven't been to any of these. I think I've been past Sorn. I've driven past it. That doesn't really count. But I'm not really much of a foodie. I enjoy great food, of course. It's quite apparent, but uh, I'm not really a foodie. There's a list at the top of the one-star Michelin restaurants, so you can freeze that frame and go through those. But again, I haven't been to any of those. And then down the bottom there, we've got five new one-star entries. Signature, Ban Tepa, Hauma, I don't know how to say that one, Potong and Maison Dunand. Uh, quite a few French sounding restaurants there in that particular list but a good international scene of good restaurants not only in the Michelin Guide but uh, just the ones that probably you and I can afford but uh, congratulations to all those restaurants that made it into the Michelin Guide uh, that's your sort of Olympics each year to get into that guide and well done to those ones that succeeded uh, the nation reporting vehicle exports and domestic sales accelerating and October saw exports of 94,228 vehicles that's a growth of 15 percent year on year so a great year for the car manufacturing industry in Thailand. Not only a recovery, but uh, I would call that somewhat of a boom. So the domestic proportion of that is some 64,618 vehicles. That's a modest 0.24% increase. So good to see that the big increase, that 15% or so, is mostly for cars being exported. Good for the bottom line in the Thai economy. And from one driver of the industry to another, this from the Bangkok Post. Tourism workers face uncertainty, employment in the sector yet to recover. This is something I hear from a lot of my friends in the tourism industry and the hotel industry saying that they're just battling at the moment to get staff. Uh, there's a whole lot of statistics here. Roughly 23% of tourism operators are willing to increase their workforce, but some remain hesitant because of insufficient tourist demand. This is a study done by the National Institute of Development and Administration, NIDA. They do a lot of surveys. And down the bottom there, many analysts see tourism as the main driver of the country's economy. Well, just alluding back to the last story we did, I would say that manufacturing is by far the biggest driver of the uh, Thai economy. Every time they talk about tourism, they're talking about uh, somewhat uh, 10 to 15 percent of Thailand's economy. So that uh, bottom line there doesn't seem to make sense. And some more numbers here. The study showed employers that can afford more employees want to hire 9.3% more employees during the second half. More than 60% of them have yet to recover to the same employment level. However, 6.8% of operators are planning to reduce their workforce by 1.9%, mostly because of poor performance, high wage costs. That's another thing I've been hearing that the places that are hiring at the moment are having to pay high higher than normal wages because the good employees at the moment for whatever reason are just hard to get and then down the bottom there 54 percent of operators didn't plan any new recruitment 35 percent looked for an opportunity to hire multi-skilled workers instead more than half of the operators didn't have a plan to adjust their employment and finally roughly 22 percent of tourism workers plan to quit their jobs in two years mostly because of the low income and lack of job security 
So uh, there you are. That's a NIDA study and uh, published in the Bangkok Post. Now, another industry that is bouncing back is the medical tourism industry. And this reported by Thailand Business News. And the headline, Thai medical tourism is bouncing back. It's been reported by the Krung Thai Compass, a research institute under the Krung Thai Bank. And according to the Krung Thai Compass, a significant portion of the 8.9 million foreign tourists that visited Thailand in 2022 came for medical care. Hang on, just read that again. A significant portion of the 8.9 million foreign tourists, I thought we just found out it was 8.2, but nonetheless, visited Thailand in 2022 for medical care. I don't think that could possibly be correct. Well, it depends what they're talking about, a significant portion. Are they talking about uh, 10% or 90%? Anyway, that's the claim made in this report. Thailand leads other Asian nations in terms of the proportion of hospitals and have achieved the JCI accreditation, the gold standard for patient safety. And we've got uh, 60 JCI accredited medical sites in Thailand compared to 37 in India, 31 in Japan, 17 in Malaysia and 5 in Singapore. Well, that's slightly surprising. Probably uh, JCI might just be a more popular accreditation here in Thailand. Places like Malaysia and Singapore also have excellent uh, medical care. Let's, uh, they've got a few cost comparisons now, so this might be of interest. Bypass surgery and heart valve replacement, not something that I'm looking at uh, anytime soon. While this kind of operation might cost in US dollars 75,000, it will probably only set you back a third of that amount in Thailand. And this is the reality with a lot of these expensive procedures. Uh, hip replacements can cost more than 33,000 US. The same treatment might only cost 13,000 in Thailand. A knee replacement procedure can cost 30,000, but only 11,500 in Thailand. So there's a few cost comparisons done in thailand-news.business.com. Com. Uh, just noting that uh, the eye surgery, I had the refractive lens exchange, which I've been very, very happy with. It cost me at least half that it would have cost me in my home country of Australia. And in my case, the medical care, the attention, the after sales service, everything was uh, exemplary. And I'll be speaking to the doctor that did my surgery on our Saturday program next week. So uh, the doctor will be joining me to answer your questions. And tomorrow we've got uh, a young Russian expat who will be our guest tomorrow. So uh, ramping up the live programs on Saturday mornings. Uh, some good news now. We've got uh, on Sunday, a cruise ship will dock in Koh Samui in southern Thailand for the first time in three years. An MV Viking Mars cruise liner carrying 700 tourists, mostly Europeans, will make their way to the island from Singapore. And just noting this week we had a much bigger cruise liner in Patong Bay, some 3,000 passengers. And this weekend, I think it's tomorrow, the uh, first charter flight, direct flight from Russia, lands at the Utupau Airport, uh, which services Pattaya and Rayong. And, uh, of course, they'll be arriving just in time to catch the Pattaya fireworks display. So good luck with all that. Uh, there will be some Russian people joining you, flying directly into Utapau. Uh, and just finally today, finishing with a slightly more serious story uh, from the Bangkok Post. Hurt journos want riot cops probed. This is the fallout from the APEC meeting, which was held last week in Bangkok. And the police made it fairly clear all the way along that they weren't going to be tolerating any protesters that were making their way towards uh, the Queen Sirikit Convention Centre. Now, I note where the place where most of this violence happened, we'll get to that in a moment, was uh, called Dinso Road, which is right near the Grand Palace. And it would have taken them to get to the Queen Sirikit uh, Centre an hour and 59 minutes, let's say two hours, and, oh, I should also notice that I think protesters are going to be walking a little bit slower than uh, just a solo person making their way around the city. But anyway, Google says it's going to take them an hour, 59 minutes, a trip of some 9.2 kilometres. 
Uh, so the protesters were a long, long way from the APEC meeting, and I certainly thought that they were a bit heavy-handed, given that they were no threat to the meeting where they were. But the story goes on saying that a representative of four photojournalists injured in the clash uh, have filed a petition and they're seeking a probe into the incident where riot control police allegedly assaulted journalists on November the 18th. The civil court last year issued an order that police are required to take the safety of journalists into consideration. Oh, that's nice. Uh, mostly these days, journalists wear a, I think it's a red armband, and uh, they have to wear identification around their neck from where they're from. So they have to be accredited uh, journalists to go and cover these incidents. Uh, many people have thought the crowd control measures carried out on that day by police were brutal. Well, we did get to see uh, police kicking people on the ground. That looked pretty brutal to me. And the use of rubber bullets. And as I said, these people were 9.2 kilometres away from the Queen Surrogate Centre. And uh, the spokesperson said the petition demands police reveal documents concerning the use of rubber bullets and other defence equipment used for crowd control on the day. And down the bottom there, four journalists from The Matter, Top News, Prachatai and Reuters were injured in the clash between police and protesters. So we will hear more about that in the next few months as it goes through court. A lot of uh, photographic and video evidence. A lot of people, of course, had their phones out on the day. And as I said, they were 9.2 kilometres away from the APEC meeting. I don't think they were in any way a threat to uh, the delegates at the meeting. And with that, I thank you very much for watching today. I hope you've enjoyed the program during the week. Please subscribe to the channel. Uh, also, big thanks to Five Star Marine, our sponsors. Link down there in the description. And I hope you have a fantastic weekend. We'll be back on Monday with another TNT. But uh, from me, the Cats, and Studio One, thanks for watching.